morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Zinc Lansomwa in for Savannah Sellers. It's another busy day of news with two major stories we're following this morning. One of them in Washington, where history is unfolding. Day two of Supreme Court confirmation hearings about to get underway in the Senate this morning for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. If confirmed, she would be the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Thank you for this historic chance to join the highest court to work with brilliant colleagues to inspire future generations and to ensure liberty and justice for all. But President Biden's nominee faces opposition from Republicans who are promising pointed questions for Jackson today, particularly her record on criminal cases. We have full coverage of what we can expect today coming up in just a few minutes. The other major story we're following this morning is the war in Ukraine. This morning, several key cities bombed beyond recognition, with President Biden warning that Russia could soon escalate its assault with chemical weapons. Russian forces are inching closer to the center of the country's capital, Kyiv, but Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says his country will fight till the end. And Ukraine's armed forces say they've reclaimed control of a city 30 miles west of the capital. All this as the refugee crisis grows. The UN now says more than three and a half million people have been forced from their homes, most of them women and children. The most traumatic question I had from my kid is why Russians try to kill us. And I really don't understand why they want to kill us. We have team coverage this morning. Military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs will help us take a closer look at Russia's military progress and the Ukrainian resistance. But we're going to start in Ukraine with NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter in the western city of Volovets. Molly, good to have you with us. Let's start with the humanitarian effort. Ukraine says it evacuated a little more than 8,000 people on Monday. That includes about 3,000 from hard-hit Mariupol. What is the situation like over there right now? Joe, good morning. And 3,000, not even close to the numbers that Ukrainian officials are hoping uh, to see come out of that besieged city. There are an estimated 300,000 people still inside. And this, of course, is the southeast city, uh, which has just been besieged, has been starved out by the Russians. Now, the only way out uh, are these evacuation quarters, which have continually failed. But you have to now get in private cars to get to two villages that are just on the outset, uh, on the outskirts of Mariupol. Buses actually can't get in anymore. So you have to go through about 15, 16 checkpoints. Get to those two villages, and Joe, that is where you can get on buses. Go to another city called Berdyansk. It is also on the coast. It is also strategic, becoming increasingly dangerous. That is where people are getting their first uh, load of medical supplies, much-needed food, water. They are then getting on buses and going up to Zaporizhia, Joe. And Zaporizhia is where a big train station is. That is where people are getting on the trains uh, and heading westward to Lviv or to Volovets, where I am. And last week, when those first trains arrived from Zaporizhia with residents of Mariupol, that's when we started to get firsthand accounts from people who have actually survived for the last three weeks, Joe. I want to also ask you about the southern city of Kherson, which has been captured by Russian forces. Yesterday, we saw Russian troops try and disperse Ukrainian protesters who were rallying against the occupation. What more can you tell us about what happened there? Joe, that's right. And this is, as you say, the first city that Russians uh, have been able to take over and actually hold and continue to occupy. There were protests out, as there have been many days uh, in recent, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and they came out, Russian forces came out with stun grenades and gunfire. In a statement uh, from officials there, they said Russian security forces ran up, started throwing stun grenades into the crowd and shooting. Now, on the video that we have seen and our team has verified, we hear loud bangs uh, and we hear gunfire and we see a lot of civilians unarmed running for cover, Joe. And I also want to ask you about looking forward. We heard last night Ukraine's President Zelensky again calling for a meeting with President Putin, saying that he's open to dropping his country's ambition to join NATO. That's a key Russian demand. So at this point, how likely is a meeting between both leaders, something that will actually perhaps bring Putin to the table? 
That's exactly right. And this is not the first time President Zelensky has said this or asked for this meeting. We have heard him in many of his late night selfie addresses that he says Putin and I need to sit down and talk. Now, word is uh, from two FT journalists with sources inside the negotiating room. They say that Mariupol has been a sticking point in the negotiations. Russians obviously see Mariupol as a huge strategic win. But we know the Ukrainians are not backing down, according to defense officials uh, from the UK this morning. The Ukrainians are continuing uh, to put up a very good fight. Russians' uh, forces are not being able to uh, continue to encroach on that city. But as far as what will get Vladimir Putin to the table, Dmitry Peskov is speaking right now in Moscow. We may get some indication after that press conference whether or not anything has changed. But up until now, Joe, we have no indication that Vladimir Putin uh, is serious about getting to the table with President Zelensky. All right. Molly Hunter reporting from Ukraine. Molly, thank you so much. Let's get more on the situation in Ukraine with NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, good to have you on again. I want to start by asking you about the Ukrainian military's latest operational report. For those unfamiliar, the report claims that Russian forces on the ground have food and ammunition stockpiles that will last no more than just three days. However, the report also says that in the sky, Russia's aviation presence has increased over the past 24 hours. So knowing all that, is it fair to say Russia has had more success in the skies than it has on the ground? Well, it hasn't had very much success on the ground by their own standards. They didn't achieve their objectives. They didn't achieve anything as quickly as they thought they would. And a lot of it has to do with the courage of the Ukrainian people and the, and the uh, anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons they've received from the West. But the Russians have also suffered from an inability to use their tactical capabilities to the fullest. They tend to stick to the roads. Uh, they're all in vehicles. They're easy to pick off. They don't have security on the flanks or to the front. It is easy for the Russians to resupply uh, on the ground, less easy in the air because they do not have tactical air superiority. There is air parity at best in some areas. And the Ukrainians have ground-to-air anti-aircraft we weapons that are very, very effective. Uh, but the, the, the Russians are having a great deal of trouble using their tactical advantage, uh, uh, their tactical capability to good advantage. And as long as the Ukrainians continue to harass the Russian formations and take their toll in large numbers of Russian killed and wounded, uh, the stalemate might continue. And then I, I hear you saying that Russia may be struggling. And I know yesterday, President Putin, excuse me, President Biden gave one of his strongest warnings yet uh, that Russian President Vladimir Putin may be considering use of chemical or biological weapons. Warning against that. Let's hear what he said. His back is against the wall. And uh, he's, now he's talking about new false flags he's setting up, including... He's asserting that we, America, have biological as well as chemical weapons in Europe. Simply not true. I guarantee you. They're also suggesting that Ukraine has biological and chemical weapons in Ukraine. That's a clear sign he's considering using both of those. So hearing that, do you think it's likely Putin will use these kinds of weapons in Ukraine? And how would that impact the West's response to this conflict, if at all? Well, we don't know if it's likely, but it's certainly possible. Um, don't forget, we have the capability of listening to everything that these people say, both on the ground and in the Kremlin. And we have some idea of what their objectives are, both tactical and strategic. And if you consider the fact that Putin has indiscriminately shelled uh, population areas, is not focused necessarily on Ukrainian forces, but instead... Uh, using artillery, missiles, and other indirect fire to destroy the infrastructure of Ukraine and terrorize the Ukrainian people and kill large numbers of them. If you consider that, then the conclusion that you wouldn't put anything past Putin, including the use of chemical weapons, and as some suggested, small-yield tactical nuclear weapons, you wouldn't put any of that past him.
And Colonel, you've talked a lot about what's happening on the ground. I want to get your take on the diplomatic efforts to end this war. Ukraine has signaled a willingness to meet some of Russia's security demands, including the idea of becoming a neutral country and dropping that bid to join NATO, as we heard again from President Zelensky yesterday. What will it take for Putin to end this conflict? Well, I can't see Putin sitting down to the table with anybody. He doesn't, he doesn't even sit next to any of his advisors, as we saw in that iconic photograph of him sitting at the end of a very long refectory table. Uh, he's not going to sit down with anybody. And the, there's been a suggestion that there is a way to have a negotiated settlement. We're probably a long way from that. But it would include... Things that have already happened, that is an assertion by Ukraine that it's not going to join NATO. Uh, but it's also going to include uh, giving up, Ukraine's giving up the eastern provinces and, most importantly, the seacoast on the Black Sea, which Russia desperately wants. But I don't see any of that happening anytime soon. Important analysis. Colonel Jack Jacobs, thanks so much. The flow of refugees into Eastern Europe is showing no signs of slowing down. More than three and a half million Ukrainians have now left their homes for countries in Eastern Europe. And the mass exodus is putting a sizable strain on Poland. That country alone has welcomed more than two million refugees since the war began. For more on the refugee situation, let's go to NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray, who joined us now from a town near the Polish border. Jay, good morning. So the town you're in is seeing huge flows of refugees because it serves as a major transportation center that then helps get refugees to other parts of Europe. Walk us through what the situation is like where you're at right now. Yeah, Joe, you're absolutely right. We're in the Prashima train station, about three miles from the actual border crossing and the first real train station inside Poland if you're coming from western Ukraine. And, and you can see, not packed right now, but that's because uh, people are flowing through in waves. You see families coming through and this area gets full and, and then it'll, they'll get on trains or buses and, and head out and, and it drops off again and then uh, runs back through again. But you can see as, as you look along, it gives us kind of a snapshot of, of what happens here. People buying tickets, people uh, consulting with law enforcement here, and, and most important for a lot of people, grabbing a, a hot meal, a, a soup, or some water, something uh, that they can have that they haven't had perhaps for uh, two or three days as they've tried to make the journey here. Getting here a lot more difficult. We talked about that. Uh, we know that right now there are more than seven million people in Ukraine who are homeless. They don't have a home anymore. Many of them don't have a community. It's, it's been uh, taken away by what's happened in this war, uh, but they can't get to the border. And, and so that's a real struggle uh, that many are dealing with at this point. But again, they come through here and it's very transient. They, they don't stay very long because they've got to move elsewhere. And as you talked about coming into all this, Joe, Poland, uh, for the most part, when it comes to long-term refugees, is about full. I mean, we've talked with the mayor of Warsaw, who, who says his community, his city, the biggest in Poland, has uh, seen a population rise of 19 percent by refugees alone. So there are 19 percent more people in Warsaw just in refugees that have shown up there. He says all of his city services right now have been dedicated to those refugees and that he's got to find a, a balancing point where he can start to take care of his city again. And, and it's only going to get more difficult because, as the U.N. has said, a lot of those 7 million are expected to head this way, and that number over the next several weeks is expected to grow. Yeah, I mean, Jay, that city alone, Warsaw, has welcomed more than 300,000 Ukrainian refugees since the war broke out. The mayor you're talking about, he yeah. says it's a struggle to help more refugees. So is there anything that's actually being done to try and redirect refugees to other cities or other countries? Or does it seem like many Ukrainians are still heading to the capital? Well, well, I think many are headed that way, but what they've done, not only at the Warsaw train station, but here as well, has made more opportunities for them to get elsewhere. Tickets are paid for, so that's not an issue, but they added routes going to Germany, going to the Czech Republic. We've seen people flooding in who want to take people to Spain. We've seen organizations coming in saying they'll take people to the Finland, to the U.K. And, and so uh, the broader European Union is getting involved here and trying to help. But what Poland's saying is we need to help now, that, that waiting is, is not an option because they know so many more are on the way.
Jay Gray continuing to shine a light on the successes and the struggles happening there along the border in Poland. Jay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. We want to turn now to the other big story we're covering this morning. It is a historic week on Capitol Hill as the Supreme Court confirmation hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson resume later this morning. Judge Jackson will face a long day of questioning from Senate Judiciary Committee members, putting her one step closer to making history as the first black woman on the Supreme Court. Judge Jackson delivered a powerful and personal opening statement yesterday detailing her long and impressive career while acknowledging the magnitude of this moment. My parents taught me that unlike the many barriers that they had had to face growing up, my path was clearer so that if I worked hard and I believed in myself in America, I could do anything or be anything I wanted to be. If I am confirmed, I commit to you that I will work productively to support and defend the Constitution. I know that my role as a judge is a limited one, that the Constitution empowers me only to decide cases and controversies that are properly presented. And I know that my judicial role is further constrained by careful adherence to precedent. The 22 senators on the Judiciary Committee will each have 30 minutes to question Judge Jackson. Joining us now with a preview is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. Good morning, Ali. Today will be a very long day. I'm sure you've had your coffee, but first, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I hope you've had your coffee. Uh, but first, set the scene for us. What did Judge Jackson and senators say in their opening statements? Yeah, first of all, my friend, there is never enough coffee, and definitely not when we're heading into the Q&A portion of the confirmation hearings that we're about to start today. What we heard yesterday, though, was a really good preview, both from Judge Jackson herself, but also from the senators who were sitting on that dais. What we heard from Republicans, I think, is the thing that we're going to really seize on today, the way that they're going to try to piece together her record, some of them trying to paint it as one that's soft on crime, the administration, and the judge herself going to do the work to rebut that. And we saw some pre-battles of that yesterday. But then also trying to apply their larger strategy of the midterms, trying to paint the Biden administration and Democrats as soft on crime. That kind of fits squarely with what they're trying to do with the judge here. And you can listen, for example, to some of the ways that this manifested yesterday. First, you'll hear from Senator Lindsey Graham talking about the long shadow that was cast by the 2018 Judge Kavanaugh hearings. That's something the Republicans invoked multiple times. And then, of course, you'll hear from Senator Ted Cruz. Take a listen to that. You're the beneficiary of Republican nominees having their lives turned upside down. And it didn't work. So I am hoping that we can have a hearing that's respectful, that's informative, that's challenging. Law after law after law that they can't get through the Democratic process, the Democrats have decided it's much simpler to convince five lawyers in black robes than to try to convince 330 million Americans. So a few things here. One Republican senator yesterday said that they wanted this to be thorough but civil. That's important when you think about the ways that they're hearkening back to the Kavanaugh hearing. At the same time, though, what we saw Judge Jackson do and her validators, really, her friend Lisa Fairfax, and then also Judge Griffith, who were her introducers yesterday in front of the hearing, pre-butting a lot of the criticisms that she might get from Republicans. Griffith himself is a conservative lawyer. And you heard Jackson there yesterday saying that she is someone who believes that she should be limited and she's constrained by the Constitution. Those kinds of pre-buttles will hit directly at Republicans who are going to try to paint her as some kind of activist judge or rubber stamp for the administration. That's something we already heard yesterday, but we're definitely going to hear more of that today. Yeah, so Ali, all that lays the groundwork for today. The 22 senators on the Judiciary Committee will each be able to question yeah. Judge Jackson for 30 minutes. And that's just round one. Then there's more after that. So today, which senators are you keeping an eye Don't on? Don't remind me. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, then, and what are the issues you think are going to come up in this first day of questioning? 
Yeah, it's exactly what we were talking about. Each senator gets 30 minutes today, and then there's another round of questions tomorrow. Look, the goal for the sources that I've spoken to on the committee that's sort of been guiding Jackson through this process is to keep this as low-key as possible. You've seen them repeatedly try to elevate this out of the partisan and into the biographical, into her record, into her qualifications. So far, they have largely been able to do that. The few of the people that I'm watching, though, Josh Hawley is a key person here. He's someone who has tried to make hay over the issue of being soft on crime through the lens of some of her sentencing for child porn offenders. That has been debunked completely by multiple nonpartisan fact checkers, as well as even some conservative prosecutors who have said that they probably would have done the same thing in that situation. Hawley, nevertheless, likely to press that line of questioning. And then, of course, we're also going to hear from other Republicans who want to get a better sense of her judicial view, the way that she decides cases, the way that she has thought these things through in the past. She's not going to speak directly to key issues. Judges don't do that. And of course, in the past, they've been asked, but there's precedent for them to say that they're not going to speak to things that will come in front of the court. Nevertheless, today could be a day with fireworks, but largely the goal for Democrats and the nominee is to make it not that way. Important analysis as always, Ali. Thank you so much. Let's bring in Ola Tunde Johnson. She is a professor of law at Columbia. Professor Johnson, good to have you with us. So first, let's start with what happened yesterday. What stood out to you during the opening statements? Yeah, you really felt the history of the moment. And you felt that um, in the introductions and, of course, in her um, opening statement. I was surprised by how moved I was. People talk in abstract terms about things like legitimacy and um, role models. Um, but she was really watching her family and watching her situate herself in the history of her family, the meaning of her name, um, what it, it meant that her parents came from a segregated background, and yet she was someone who was the child of uh, our civil rights, you know, actualization, our American dream. So that really struck me in the opening statements, just the historic significance of the moment made real. And you've touched on this, but put Judge Jackson's nomination into the U.S. historical context for us and the context of our democracy. Yeah, and I think she did that in a couple of ways. I mean, one, of course, she would be the first black woman on the court, the first woman of color um, at all on the court. There haven't been that many any women at all. Um, and then I just think the history um, that she talked about was the history of our democracy more broadly. And she talked about the Civil Rights Act. She talked about Constance Baker Motley, who was the first black woman judge, um, a lower court judge who had worked um, and argued um, Brown versus Board of Education with Thurgood Marshall. So she really situated herself in that idea of we're now actualizing our American democracy when we have this kind of representation on our court. And I, th I thought that was very profound and beautifully done. Professor Johnson, let's look ahead to today. What are you looking forward to as the questioning gets underway? What are the issues you expect senators, especially some of the Republican senators who may try to challenge the judge? What do you think they're going to focus yes. on? Yes. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, yesterday, I think you saw a preview. I mean, you saw yesterday that Democrats were really emphasizing the breadth of her experience, um, her role as a trial judge for so many times, um, so long, you know, for seven, eight years, um, the fact that she's rarely reversed, um, her broad experience um, in private practice as a public defender, her knowledge of the Constitution, and, of course, that she clerked for Justice Breyer. She brought that up. He's a pragmatic judge, um, known for his integrity and his civility. And she really cast herself in the mold of that. And I expect those themes about pragmatism to repeat themselves. And then you saw the Republicans. And I think that what they will emphasize are fears about um, how her judicial methodology will be. They talked about liberal constitutionalism. I think they'll talk about crime, which you've already mentioned in your segment which, um, you know, is not a fair characterization of her overall record, but um, is something I do expect them to ask about. Um, and I also expect them um, to spend a lot of time on the politics. It's hard to say whether I'm looking forward to that, but it's understandable, right? Um, so this is framed within a larger political context in which you're worried about the midterms um, and not just about Katanji Brown-Jackson. So I think you'll see that in play. Well, Professor Johnson, thank you for giving us that large context on a very big day. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Coming up on Morning News Now, path of destruction. Parts of the South reeling from tornadoes and flooding with 10 million people at risk for more. We'll tell you one of the areas bracing for the worst. Plus, sweet relief. If you reach for some chocolate when you're feeling down, you're not alone. The link with those sweet treats and your mental health next in our weekly check-in. Welcome back. More of our coverage on the war in Ukraine coming up, including the civilians joining the fight against Russia through hacking. But first, here are some of the other major stories making news right now. We've got more severe storms on the way in the south. That could impact millions of Americans this morning. Several tornadoes touched down in Texas and Oklahoma yesterday, leaving behind a path of destruction in its wake. But the region is not out of the woods yet, and severe weather is expected to hit the area again throughout the day. BC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from Jacksboro, Texas, which is north of Fort Worth. Good morning to you, Morgan. Yeah, guys, good morning and a frightening night for so many Texans. Tornado watches and warnings stretching for hundreds of miles across the state. And today we're getting our first glimpse at some of the damage. I'm in front of Jacksboro Elementary School. Hard to believe that there were hundreds of students and teachers inside this building when uh, a suspected tornado struck right around 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, essentially shearing off one side of the school. Fortunately, no one was seriously injured, uh, and we are talking about a trail of destruction that stretches all across the state. Severe storms slamming Texas. It's moving to our north but it's crossing the road. With tornadoes, heavy winds and rain, and even snow falling across the state. Tornado on the ground right now. Just outside Austin in Round Rock, a confirmed tornado tearing across Highway I-35 during rush hour traffic. Get inside, get inside. Run, run, run. Sending shoppers running to take cover inside this Walmart run, run. and ripping off the side of a bank. It was moving cars, it was tipping over trees. You can see this tornado ripping through Elgin, a suburb near Austin, tossing a red truck on its side before it's flipped again and then somehow drives away. On the ground, some homes now completely demolished. Another confirmed twister hitting the town of Bowie. Take a look at the surveillance camera footage showing a garage decimated by the storm. The Toon family says they were taking cover inside their kitchen. I, like, just instinct ran towards the bathroom, but the wall came down and the refrigerator fell over on me. Rescuers digging them out from under debris. If the fire department and the other rescue teams didn't get here, we would still be there. And in Jacksboro, a potential tornado likely tearing through the city. The wind just hit my house, felt like it was rising up, things were slamming. Local officials say around 80 homes were destroyed. Many of our homes have been totally demanded, or demolished and families have been um, removed from their, their places of residence. The tornado damaging the elementary school and ripping off the roof from the local high school's gymnasium as students huddled inside in storm shelters. Outside, cars in the parking lot thrown upside down. The tornado passed right over us. It was scary. I never want to deal with that again. Uh, and again, nearly 20 suspected tornadoes reported across the state of Texas. Governor Greg Abbott saying it is a miracle that there have been no reports of any serious injuries or deaths at this time. We'll send it back to you. Thanks, Morgan. Really terrifying images. Thanks and for that. With that, we do want to get a check on your morning news now weather. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now for the latest updates on the tornado. Bill, good morning. Yeah, good morning. It is a miracle. I mean, these were some strong tornadoes. In all, we've had 20 reports of tornadoes. Most of those were in between the San Antonio area and Lufkin, Texas, right near Austin, where you saw that one in the broadcast crossed the highway, and then numerous tornadoes near Bryan, Texas also. So that was all between around 5 p.m. and about 11 p.m. last night. Since then, we haven't had any confirmed tornadoes. We still do have some tornado watches that are out from the Houston area to Monroe, Louisiana. And actually, Houston right now has some very strong thunderstorms about to go through the city. You are under a severe thunderstorm warning at this time for strong winds. No tornado warnings at this time. 
but this will all regenerate with the heating of the day. This line of storms will move through Louisiana and Mississippi, and you don't want to be in that red bullseye area. That is where we have a moderate risk of severe weather. That is a, with the potential for not just tornadoes, but strong tornadoes that are on the ground for a long period of time. So anywhere from Lafayette, just south of Alexandria to Macomb, Jackson, Meridian, Waynesboro, make sure you have your plan to keep your family safe in case a tornado warning is issued for your area. Um, again, a very dangerous afternoon and evening. Very similar to yesterday, maybe even potentially worse. And then on Wednesday, this line will make its way through the southeast. It will not be as severe. Wind damage will be the biggest threat. We shouldn't have as many tornadoes. They should be more isolated in nature. But from Raleigh to Charlotte to just south of Atlanta, Savannah, Charleston, a lot of our big southeast cities are included in that risk. And if that wasn't enough, this is such a slow-moving storm that flash flooding is going to be a big problem. We already have flash flood warnings in the maroon color, 16 million people in flash flood watches. And we do have the possibility for significant flash flooding from Monroe to Greenville, the northern half of Mississippi. So the southern half of Mississippi is the tornado threat. The northern half is the flash flooding threat. And then late tonight, this heads to Tuscaloosa and Birmingham and the possibility of an additional five to six inches of rain on top of what you already have seen. So uh, once again, all eyes will be on Louisiana and Mississippi, guys. Uh, uh, potentially dangerous and potentially deadly afternoon ahead. All right. We know you'll keep an eye on it, Bill. Thanks so much for that update. We appreciate it. We're more than two whole years into the pandemic, and while many have returned to some semblance of a normal life here in the United States, in other parts of the world, cases are once again beginning to rise. Let's bring in Dr. Amos Adalja for more on this. He's a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Dr. Adalja, good to have you with us. So let's start overseas. England is rolling out its second booster shot for those who are most vulnerable to COVID. That includes people both over 75 and with weakened immune systems. Of course, this comes as the Omicron subvariant continues to spread across Europe. So how might these boosters help fight that variant? And could this be a sign of things to come here in the U.S.? When you look at where fourth doses may be most beneficial, it's going to be in high-risk populations, not the entire population, but people that maybe have had some time since their booster, some time since their vaccination, and their protection against severe disease has fallen. That's where I think fourth doses may make sense, and that may be where we see in the United States fourth doses be recommended, not to the general public, but to people that are elderly, immunocompromised, high-risk conditions. That's likely to be the case uh, just to provide more protection against severe disease, which is what really matters. And doctor, an FDA advisory panel is set to meet in a few weeks to discuss the country's vaccine strategy. We know there's been mixed messaging on the best approaches. So what are officials debating exactly, especially as the vaccination rate declines? What they have to actually articulate is what the goals are with COVID-19. Are we trying to stop all infections or stop severe disease, hospitalization, and death, especially with these first-generation vaccines? So that's number one. Number two is what then is the optimal strategy? Who should be boosting? How frequently should they be boosted? What are the thresholds for changing the strain in the vaccine? Remember, the vaccine we're using is against the ancestral Wuhan strain, and now we're several variants in, and it's still holding up well against serious disease, but infections and breakthrough infections are becoming more common. So that, that's also part of it. And then they also have to think about what will happen with second generation vaccines that maybe are more universal or different than the mRNA and Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And what about full FDA approval for the J&J vaccine and other vaccines that might be coming through the FDA? So there's a lot to discuss. And doctor, I want to talk about one of the worries if we do see another surge in cases. Yesterday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the administration is concerned about a lack of COVID funding. Let's watch. Our concern right now is that um, we are going to run out of money to provide the types of vaccines, boosters, uh, treatments to the immunocompromised, uh, and others for free of charge. It's a concern we've seen echoed numerous times by doctors on this show. So what's at stake here if the U.S. does not come up with more funding for COVID? The reason why we're handling COVID so much better now is because we've got a whole slew of medical countermeasures, monoclonal antibodies, antivirals, vaccines, many of which are only available under emergency use authorization. So that means there's not a commercial market. That means it's the government that is the exclusive buyer and the exclusive distributor. So if we're going to be able to utilize these tools in the absence of a commercial market, the government needs funds to be able to purchase them, or we will not have any of the advantages that we've accrued over two years. So I think this is an example of Congress being very reactive and going back into that panic and neglect cycle that they often do with public health Emergencies. When something receives, they, they, they lose their priority. All right. Dr. Amish Adalja, as always, thank you so much. Appreciate it. 
And now it's time for our weekly mental health check-in. Admittedly, it's my favorite segment on this show, so I'm excited, where we talk through some of the biggest mental health headlines. Yeah, we also just want to take a moment to pause, take a deep breath. We had a lot of news so far this morning and reflect on our emotional well-being. Let's bring in board-certified psychiatrist Dr. Sue Varma to help us understand some of these headlines we've been seeing lately. So, Dr. Varma, um, good morning. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> and so let's start with... Morning. Yes, thanks for joining us. So let's start with March Madness. What some people may not know is that March is not just a time for sports, but it's also Gambling Awareness Month, and rightfully so, considering the magnitude of the NCAA basketball tournament. So how does gambling affect mental health, and what can we do if someone we know or love is struggling with addiction, especially during such an intense month and time? Absolutely. And I love the fact that you're recognizing it as an addiction and that we are doing so and putting it in the same category as other behavioral addictions. So there's a loss of control over our behavior. There's an intense preoccupation with gambling. There's a lot of shame and secrecy and lying that's going on. Um, and gambling addictions often co-occur with other behavioral addictions or chemical addictions in, in addition to depression and anxiety. And people with gambling addictions are at higher risk for suicide as well. So I think it's so important that family members not ostracize, not alienate these um, folks who are dealing with uh, gambling addictions and really bring them into the fold of the family and say, hey, let's get help. There are national um, hotlines, state hotlines, and cognitive behavioral therapy, sometimes medication, psychotherapy, family, family counseling can all be super beneficial with gambling addictions. We're going to offer some of that information here coming up in just a little bit That for those who are wondering if they need to mm -hmm. seek help or help someone get help. I want to ask about another consequence of the COVID pandemic. That's a spike in postpartum depression. A new study from the University of Michigan says the number of mothers experiencing postpartum depression tripled when the pandemic began. So why did we see such a dramatic spike for women and how can we start breaking the stigma surrounding postpartum depression? Yes. So postpartum depression during the pandemic really exposed a lot of the systemic challenges that women and families face. Everything from um, lack of affordable childcare to um, getting paid uh, family leave. Uh, women were so much more isolated during this time, not being able to take um, a caregiver or a loved one into um, a regular prenatal appointments, often not being able to have an additional person um, in the delivery room, perhaps even just one partner. Um, and not having a lot of the services, being left at home um, with a newborn, maybe other children, not getting the partner support if somebody was uh, working outside of the house, and their job, jobs being marginalized. So we did see an increase from anywhere from one in 10 women prior to the pandemic experiencing postpartum depression to one in three. And briefly, doctor, we want to end on a sweet note. The National Confectioners Association, which is a thing, Yay. I did not know that, <laughs> um, says consumers bought nearly three, excuse me, $37 billion worth of chocolate in 2021, a record. Uh, I know I was one of them. And experts say that record may actually be broken again this year. So knowing that, why and how do chocolates and sweets give such an impact to our mental health? And are there any downsides to relying on sweets for mental health boosts? Yes, you know, relying on mental health boosts in small amounts, dark chocolate, let's say, can uh, be beneficial for, the, for your mental health and physical health, um, and certainly not detrimental in small amounts. The problem comes when we start to rely upon them as a source of comfort, uh, which a lot of people did. Look, we're isolated, we're at home, we're doing a lot more online shopping, um, and we are feeling deprived in a lot of way of stimulation, um, and it is a quick mood booster. So again, if you're gonna do it, limit it, and keep it to, to, to the dark chocolate. Dr. Sue Varma, thanks so much. And if you or someone you know is struggling with gambling, please call the National Problem Gambling Helpline Network, 1-800-522-5700. Right, coming up, war through the eyes of a child. When we return, how the Russian invasion has impacted some of the youngest Ukrainians. Plus, hack attack, how engineers are joining the fight against Russia without leaving their home. You're watching Morning News Now. Just moments ago, Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was found guilty of fraud by a court in Moscow, a move that he claims is politically motivated. For more on that and the other international stories making headlines this morning, we're joined by NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey-Frayer. Good morning, Janice. 
Good morning, guys. Alexei Navalny, perhaps the Kremlin's biggest critic, has been found guilty of large-scale fraud by a Russian court. Now, this could add another 13 years to his current sentence. He's already serving two and a half years uh, at a prison camp outside of Moscow for parole violations on charges he said were fabricated to keep him from being politically active. Now, he is a very vocal critic of Vladimir Putin, uh, but Navalny today appeared unfazed by this verdict, and earlier this month, he said that he will never renounce his words or deeds. Some scuffles at the uh, Polish border with Belarus between truck drivers and protesters trying to stop them. The protesters have been there for a few days trying to block food, medicine and other goods from getting into Belarus. Belarus, we know, is siding with Russia and the concern of the protesters is that these supplies are going to be used against Ukraine in the war. The trucks were backed up. 25 miles with the protesters, mostly Ukrainians and Belarusians, yelling shame at the drivers. And finally, did you know that Japan and Russia are still uh, have unresolved World War II hostilities? There's still a dispute over the Kuril Islands that are off the coast of Hokkaido. That's the northern part of Japan. These are islands that Japan calls the Northern Territories. 56 islands in the archipelago covering 6,000 square miles. And there had been talks toward a peace treaty between the two countries. But the talks have been called off. Russia stormed out. Uh, it was a reaction to Tokyo's decision to impose sanctions on Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. And that's a look at your headlines today. Janice, thank you so much. Now, since the war started, UNICEF says one child has left Ukraine every second. That means more than one and a half million kids have fled Ukraine in less than four weeks. They were forced to suddenly say goodbye to home and friends with no sense of when or if they'll be able to go back. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber brings us some of their stories. When you watch children playing in the makeshift refugee shelters now scattered across Poland, you see a lot of smiles. Talk to the same kids, and you get the sense that they laugh and play, not because they're unaware of the horrors they survived, but because it is their way to survive those moments in hell. What is war? So the war is when everybody is in a battle and they are they're fighting. And we saw we saw equipment, we saw vehicles, and then I don't remember anything. It's a river of blood. It's it's loud noises. It's it's terrible. It's hard to talk about scary things, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. We don't even have our house anymore. Over three million refugees have fled Ukraine. What's her name? Tatiana. UNICEF says half are children, like Margarita and her sister Zlata. Before all of this started, what were you doing? What were your plans? Uh, oh, the plans were to go to the plans. My plans were to go out, to hang out, to study, but not to leave. I wanted to be an actress. How have you changed in the last two weeks? Do you feel like you've had to grow up? I started, I started to value everything I have as much as I never did before. I, I worry about everyone now. I worry about my relatives, my loved ones. For the older kids, there's a determination, a necessity. To help. I am looking for my little sister and my little brother try to help them. Has that been hard? Because you're just a kid too. Uh, not so hard. Pain, instead of fueling hate, galvanizing compassion. How do you do that? How do you find love in the middle of all this? Because you remember what you had before. Because you remember what you had before. 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 You remember what you had before
I want to wish them happiness and I want them to live good life and, uh, and clear, safe sky over their heads. Ellison Barber, Arwamov, Poland. And in Ukraine, everyday civilians are finding different ways to join the war effort. NBC News correspondent Ali Aruzi introduces us to a man who is using his software engineering skills to attack Russian companies online. Taras says he can't fight the Russians on the front line, but online he's doing all he can to hurt the invading country's war effort. Uh, I cannot be drafted to military directly due to health reasons, uh, but if, if anything else... But that, I do it. Taras, who asks us to conceal his identity and use a pseudonym for security reasons, says he used to be a software engineer, but the war pulled him in a different direction, cyber hacking. What was the, uh, the motivation for you to do this? I try to do whatever I can, whatever I can reach to uh, end the war, to stop it, to stop uh, killing uh, Ukrainian people. You can see as uh, goals that we would be targeting. He says his objective is to overload Russian websites by flooding them with traffic, making it impossible for servers of Russian businesses and media outlets to carry on working. To be clear, this type of attack is a crime for individuals in the United States and Russia. But Russia has deployed similar tactics in the past, according to the White House. Taras says that the cyber attacks that he and other digital fighters conduct strike deep blows to the Russian economy, as they've increased in frequency during the war, according to the cybersecurity company Rostelecom Solar. And how much damage does this do to the Russian operation? It is uh, dealing a lot of uh, monetary damage to the companies that we are targeting. These are Russian media sites, uh, sites that a lot of Russians are using, banks, uh, railway system uh, sites, uh, military governmental sites. It's not just the economy he's after, but the Russian state media. That has proved to be a harder target. Yeah, propaganda machine is um, hitting hard uh, uh, Russian people, and uh, I, I think they lost them, their minds or something. You're telling them what's happening here, sure. and, and you're, they're your family members, but they're not listening to you. Yes, they think that this is fake. Taras moved to Western Ukraine a few years ago, but says his family, like so many others, have had to run away from their homes in hard-hit areas. His grandparents faced grave dangers living in Kharkiv, but they didn't want to leave. It took a lot of persuasion, but finally he convinced them to join him. That was a huge relief. I exhaled like I never exhaled before <laughs> when, when they came. Thanks to Ali Aruzi for that report. And coming up on Morning News Now, plans on hold. Why so many Americans in the middle of renovating their homes are now being forced to wait. Plus, gasolina artist Daddy Yankee says he's retiring. More on his legendary career in music next. The cost of gas is coming down slightly, but it's still far above where it was last month, which might be fueling a surge in fuel theft. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch reports from L.A. As high gas prices continue to sting nationwide, some people apparently aren't paying a cent at the pump. One of the gentlemen has a, a dispenser key because every time they will come in, they will open the dispenser and they will, uh, they will steal gas from I mean, diesel from there. One Dallas area gas station says thieves appearing to be captured on camera here have stolen over $23,000 of diesel in recent months. A North Carolina pump says it was also hit. Plug and remote control, they bypass the pump. Once they bypass it, they don't know how to do nothing. Lift the nozzle up, choose the grid, they can start filling. AAA says the heists are part of a growing trend across the country, with thieves even drilling into cars with newer gas tanks, which you can't siphon from as easily. The reason for that likely is just because gas prices are so expensive. Over the past week, AAA says the national average price of gas has dipped slightly, but the average price of regular is still up more than 70 cents a gallon from just a month ago. And in states like California, it's still climbing. Half a tank, $76. How does that feel? Nuts. AAA says right now the average gas prices in California are the most expensive in the country. Here in Los Angeles, it can cost you even more to fill up the tank. Plus, we could see those prices go up again in the days ahead. Outside San Francisco, more than 500 workers are striking at a Chevron refinery. Chevron says it's prepared to keep up normal operations, but AAA says a shutdown could strangle California's gas supply. We're just out here trying to, you know, 
lessen the burden on our on our workers' families. It's the same plight of all uh, blue collar workers. The eye popping gas prices are sending more people into the electric vehicle market. Edmonds says searches for hybrid and electric cars are up 84 percent since last month. I'm just, I'm in love with it, especially now as I drive past gas stations. Some states are trying to help by pumping the brakes on their gas taxes. Maryland and Georgia's governors have already signed suspensions into law. We are doing our part to lessen the impact on your wallet. Our thanks to Jesse Kirsch for that report. Turning now to supply chain delays, which are causing a serious headache for people trying to renovate their homes. A CNBC's Diana Olick explains one holdup can cause a major domino effect. Robert Wilkoff bought his Bethesda, Maryland property just before the pandemic hit. From there, it just kind of fell apart. <laughs> he expected it to take about 14 months to build his new home. It's now 24 months and not done yet. The project has been plagued by supply chain delays, everything from basic construction materials to appliances. Doors, solid core doors took forever to get. And the delays just built on each other. Because if the doors aren't in, they can't trim. If they can't trim, then they can't put the flooring down. It's like everything in construction has a domino effect. And as the delays go on, the costs rise, thanks to inflation across just about everything that goes into not just building a home, but furnishing it. From a year ago, prices for window and floor coverings are up 11 percent. Living and dining room furniture up 19 percent. Major appliances up 11 percent. And even clocks, lamps and decorator items up 10 percent. I had no idea they were installing this equipment today. In Memphis, Tennessee, Winston and Elizabeth Eggleston are trying to build a pool and an extra backyard house for Winston's father to live in. It's almost become kind of comical because if anything can happen, it's been happening. Not exactly funny, though, as delay after delay prolongs the project. They're just thankful they started before prices went up. The pool that we're putting in right now would be almost double in price today if we were to start the project now. So, um, you know, at least at least we have that. Back in Bethesda, Robert Wilkoff is still waiting on his garage doors, which cost $2,000 more than he expected. Latest delivery date? I have no idea. I don't know if I'll ever see a garage door. Thanks to Diana for that report. Daddy Yankee is retiring after decades of smash hits and worldwide success. Top story anchor Tom Yamas takes a look back at his iconic career. It's the beat that lit up the early 2000s with the catchy verse, you can't help but sing. The song Gasolina would go on to define Daddy Yankee's career and eventually help catapult reggaeton into a global phenomenon. But on Sunday, the Puerto Rican rapper dropping some news, telling his massive fan base he's retiring from music while announcing the release of his final album, Legendary, and a farewell tour. Este genero, la gente dice que yo lo hice mundial. Pero fueron ustedes los que me dieron la llave para abrir las puertas para convertir este género en el más grande del mundo. Songs like Rompe, leading him to be known as the king of reggaeton, with the 45-year-old selling more than 20 million records worldwide. Despacito. But it was his feature in the smash hit Despacito that broke global records and cemented Daddy Yankee into the history books. Pasito, pasito, suave, suavecito. The video now watched more than 7 billion times on YouTube. Soon after, he became the first Latin artist to reach number one on Spotify, the first Latin urban artist to be inducted into the Billboard Hall of Fame and was named one of the most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. Daddy Yankee is arguably one of the founders of reggaeton and without a doubt, the artist that first put the music on the map at a global scale. A true music trailblazer, often credited with coining the term reggaeton in 1994, which fuses American hip hop with Latin Caribbean and Jamaican reggae. This is a man who's been very careful about keeping his music very top level and keeping what he does very top level, and he's very aware that he's an example to new generations. En los barrios donde nosotros crecimos, la mayoría queríamos ser narcotraficantes. Hoy por hoy yo bajo para los barrios, los caseríos, 
y la mayoría quieren ser cantantes. So para mí vale mucho. Daddy Yankee may be saying adiós for now, but his music, his videos, and the reggaeton is nowhere near disappearing. <laughs> And we all want to visit his fountain of youth because for sure. <laughs> the music, the face, everything is working right. for him. Absolutely. Thanks to Tom <laughs> Yamas for that report. That does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.